Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone? We are prayerful that all is well in your home, all is well in your life, and that you are good with the Lord. We are gathered here this morning to do what we have just done, the abortion of God's word. Mm -hmm. Pray that he will come back through the clouds right now and take us home. It would be very nice if we didn't have to go back to our address. <laughs> and then we can go to our eternal place of rest. So I pray that all is well with you spiritually and that you are ready to go. If you're not ready to go, then you're ready to go back home. Yeah. If you're ready to go, then you're ready to go to your spiritual place. We're so thankful for all that we have done so far in spirit and truth. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Title and subject this morning. The sermon that we had. He presented to us is what the Lord has said to the broken heart. What the Lord has said to the broken heart. And in verse 15 of Jeremiah chapter 31, the Lord will say, If everything is all right with you as an individual and everything is all right with you as a church, you're okay. Trials and tribulations come, you don't have to worry about what's going to happen. But if things are not all right at home and things are not okay with where you worship, when things come along, you don't know how to adjust to these things, you don't know how to deal with these things. And Things gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt. And there are some some things that God has put inside of us where we don't break. We bend, but we don't break when He's with us. But if He's not with us, we are gonna lose it. But God, in His love for mankind, has already pre-warned us about our spiritual state of mind. So that when we get there emotionally, when physically things start happening to us, we've got somebody that leans on us. Now, if leaning on God is not enough, then you're in trouble. You're in trouble because what God does for you and me when we call out and we cry out, he takes his, his loving arms and it's like wings. He put them around us and you can feel the spirit of God comforting you through your time of need. I mean, that's just a fact. God is like that. We, we talked about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 where there is no temptation that will overtake you than that which is common to the man. So don't worry about that stuff when it comes. Because through that temptation, God has an action. He'll make a way for you to escape. So he's not going to let Satan break you. As long as his spirit is around. Now, when you don't want his spirit, that's a whole different story. That's a whole different story now because if you want God out, God will leave. God will leave. And then you're on your own. Now, Israel thought in this time that we get ready to read, they thought that they can worship God the way he wanted and worship their idols. They thought that they could bring other things into the relationship and still give God what he wants. Well, you know, and I know that God is the judge. God, if he can't be first, he's not going to be second. Mm -hmm. Now, some of us are fine with the silver medal. Some of us are not. Some of us, when we train for four years and go to the Olympics, we have gold in mind. And when mm -hmm. we get the silver medal, we're disappointed. Oh, yeah, we smile on the podium. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because we're going home with something. But we know we're not going to be on the weedy bar. Right. Y'all ain't never seen nobody on the Wheaties box that want a silver medal. So 
always, always been the gold medal. So look at that and God's perspective. God mm -hmm. is not going to be second because if God be second, that means somebody else is first. Right. And it's not fair that the creator that created everything is be second to anybody who didn't and who was part of his creation. Because in order for God to be second, we have to put some other human being or it first. And God created the it and the other being. So that's not fair. So you got to first know where to go when times of, of, of your struggle and trials and tribulation. And he said here, because he warned them that these things were going to happen. He said, a voice was heard in Ramah. Limitation and bitter weeping. Rachel's weeping for her children. Mm -hmm. Refusing to be comforted by her children because they are no more. Mm -hmm. Thus says the Lord, Re refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord. And they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own board. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know anything about Jeremiah, you know anything about the story, you know the Babylonians are coming. God is going to use them to come in to take Israel's mind down because Israel has put up idols and God is not going to be second. Now, for all of us who have children, all of us who have homes, remember, when things don't go right in the home, economically, everybody suffers. Mm -hmm. Now, the children don't know when you're broke because you do a very good job, and I do a very good job of letting them know and let them, let them not know about the finances. Food is still on the table, clothes are still on the back, the room still is warm. Yes. But you know money has slowed down. Right. They don't know that. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, the children are going to find out that mom and dad messed up. Because the children are going to be part of the weeping process. Because remember, when the Babylonians come in, they're taking everybody with them. They're going to leave the old, they're going to leave the sick, and everybody else that is good for their kingdom, they're taking away. And everybody's going to suffer. Because you're going to get dragged off into a land that's not your land, you're going to go to a language that is not your language, and they're going to take the mom, the dad and the children. And it's because of our far ass parents that that will happen. So just remember, just remember, if you don't do a good job at home, Satan's gonna come in and he's gonna take you away. And there's gonna be weeping. It's gonna be weeping. Because when we meet David, and we can't ask him this question because it'd be a question of sorrow. So we have to read it and, and say, we, we have to read about what happened. When those children start acting up, he only could go back to the sin with Bathsheba and what God said. That the sword would never leave your house simply because you have forgot about it. So he had no choice but to understand that he was part of the problem and that his children were going to be affected by the things that he did. Isn't that sad? That's sad. So we, we, we got to understand what's going on. And, they, and the Babylonians are coming in when they take away. But grace in love and long suffering be to God in his holy name they shall come back from the land of Canaan because the remnant is going to be saved but the wicked and the bad and the disobedient is going to be destroyed because sometimes children are just like their parents that's why a lot of times God told them go in and throw everything that stood up the dogs, the cats, the cows, the goats, the children, the farmer, and the mother. Because children are products of their parents. Mm -hmm. But there's going to be weeping on them. And if you've ever yeah, watched CNN, right. and seen, they say right now, the Syrian refugee number is up to a million people. Wow. People fleeing from conflict. And when you get to see those footages, you see women holding their children. You see children crying because they have been displaced. And you see the weeping and the disparity on people's faces because things are not right. Are things all right in your home? Mm -hmm. If things are right in your home, everything's all right. Is God in your home? Then everything's all right. If God's not in your home, your life is in disarray. And you know who's going to be affected by that? The children. Because when dad is removed, some of the daughters suffer 
the mom is removed, the son and the daughter suffer. Because the family is out of sin. It's out of in harmony with God. So we always remember when we start bringing other things in our mind, we're making other things first and God second, something is going to be affected. Turn with me to um, Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. said to me, I don't want you to be that anymore. 
Now, he may not like it because he's 17, getting ready to go. But he has always had it in his life. And his father's sitting right here. And his mother's sitting right here. Ask Kimberly, how many times I have kissed her? And I can go on and on and on. You know why? Because we must protect the children. Because if not, there is going to be weeping. And we're going to lose the next generation. God said in Malachi that I want godly offspring. If the church fail, the church is failed. So while you're out there running around with your idols, while you're out there doing the things that you want to do, you better be thinking about what you're leaving behind. Because what you're leaving behind will be the next generation of do's and don'ts. So as a parent, we can't get tired. As a church, we can't get tired. As ministers, we can't get tired. As elders and deacons, we can't get tired. Why? Because the church is dependent. Because they're going to be weak. And it's sad. Isaiah understood the same thing in the Old Testament. The same thing. He knew the Messiah was coming. Brothers and sisters, what I just read to you, if you're still in Matthew, Go back up to verse 13, Matthew chapter 2. It says, And when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in the church of the Lord, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, leave Egypt, and stay in until I bring the word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And he arose, he took the young child and his mother that night and departed for Egypt. Was there unto the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, who yes. the prophet saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. The Bible doesn't talk much about Joseph or what he does, it talks positively about him. He is righteous. And remember this, brothers. That's why I made the analogy that I made. Remember, Jesus wasn't Joseph's son. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to talk from a male perspective right now. Mm -hmm. Just imagine your bride, your sparkle in your eye, your snooze, honey, butterfly, honeycomb, whatever it is that you call your wife, your girlfriend, or whatever, says to you, I'm with the child. And honey, by the way, it's not yours. Now, God picked the right mother for Jesus and the right father for Jesus. Now, Joseph, physical and mental reaction was to do it. Not stole her when she had every right to do. Let me put her away. And this is where righteousness comes in. That which she carried is cool. I want to say it one time. Joseph refrained from what he was doing because of his righteousness. God picked the right man. Now, God entrusted Joseph with Jesus, all of Jesus' life, and Joseph did a great job raising the boy mm -hmm. in this world. And this was getting ready to get fit. When your wife told you that y'all was having a baby, because I think that's the way it went, mm -hmm. did you know that God had gave you as the father of that child, the responsibility to raise that child righteously for him? Or did you, you think, or did you think it was just, I don't know what you thought. But I can tell you spiritually, when you got the information that you are having a baby, mm -hmm. don't you know from heaven it has now become a righteous, a righteous a righteous responsibility for you to raise that child for God. Mm -hmm. 
There's two spiritual beings that want humanity. God the Father and Satan. You're either going to protect and raise that child spiritually, or you're going to put that child in arm's way with Satan. And at the end, there's going to be weakness and gnashing of teeth. You see how the Bible keeps flowing? You're going to cry physically as a parent by disowning your responsibility and running. And at the end, right when you get ready to go to hell, you're going to be punished for it where you're going to be weeping again. So you're going to cry in the physical world, and then you're going to cry in the spiritual world mm -hmm. where you're separated from God simply because you didn't do what God asked you to do when you did what you did to start what you were doing. Ebonically right. speaking. So now you understand that no matter what you do, you are and I am responsible to God for what we do. Whether it's ourselves individually or whether it's for our children. That's why even in the church, the church can't fail. Because they're always going to be, until Jesus come back, a generation coming up right behind us. We have to always carry the gospel down. Because if we don't do that, they're not going to do it. Our sons and daughters may be sitting in another congregation. Amen? All right. They go to school and they may get a job somewhere else. They may not come back home and worship here. They may worship somewhere else. We must sit them already ready. So they know. And please, whatever you do, raise them up in the Lord so when they get old, they won't forget it because it may not be their season right now. There can be something going on in the home that will affect them and why they won't come to the gospel. See, it's always going to be our responsibility. So don't debate me on this. There's a reason why our children do the right thing and don't do the right thing. Sin is one of them because of the pull of the world. But if we don't train them and teach them the gospel way, when it's time for them to wake up, they have nothing to wake up to because they have nothing to see. And the first thing children do is believe mom and dad before they believe anything else. When the road gets hard, they're going to come home or they're going to call home and ask mom and ask dad. They're going to ask mom more than dad. So we have no choice, y'all. And as long as you're alive, you've got to be a parent. As long as you're alive, you've got to tell the truth to your children. Because if you don't, you're going to die watching yourself lose. When they brought the news back to David that his precious Absalom, was dead, he was already fasting in sackcloth and ashes for the Lord. Shaved his head, got himself clean, got up, and moved on with the kingdom. It was in his heart he knew it. I lost Absalom. And Absalom was a byproduct of bad leadership in the home. We thank God for something, man. Bad problem. So, we're going to pay one way or the other. We're going to pay. So, think about this. These people had no regard at all in Jerusalem for the youth. They had no regard at all for the elderly. They had no regard for the, for the handicapped. They had no regard for their own household. They start putting up those dumb, man-made gods with their hands all around the place, in their little rooms, on their property, on every hill that they can affect them. God said it got so bad that you put up more idols than the pagan people that was under the idols. Isn't that a shame that these people had the nerve on the Sabbath day to still try to worship me? You have replaced me. I am now second in your life and something else is first. And you think I'm not going to push back? And God pushed back. And the only thing came back to Jerusalem was the remnant. And the remnant that came back was not affected by the captivity. Will that be your son and my son? Will that be your daughter and my daughter? Or will that be us? Think about it. Think about it. Because there will be weakness. Get up in the morning and do your prayer. Pray to the Lord and just give him first the credit for being the creator of creation.
And then petition God with your list. For your oldest to your youngest, get very specific about what you're doing and what's going on in your life. And always, if you get in, if at some, at some point you, you feel locked down, turn to Job chapter 1. Just turn to Job chapter 1. And remember this about Job chapter 1. In the first verse, there was a man in the land of us, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned the name. His integrity, integrity was in the But he had seven sons and three daughters who were born. Now in verse 5, it says, as it was. When the days of feasting had run their course, when the party was over, that Job was sin and sanctified them, he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. So he individually prayed for each one of these kids. So Job said, it may be that my son have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, thus Job be ready. At this particular juncture in your home, where the children are cutting up, when it's time for you to pray, don't look at God as the problem. Look at God as the source. Get specific with God about what's going on with those children. And say to God as a parent, my sons or my daughter or my son or my daughter or my daughter have lost their mind. Get specific with God. Remember parents. Remember brothers and sisters. Remember single parents. There is nothing cute to God when it comes down to disobedience. You and I are the only ones that make excuses for our kids. God don't make excuses for mankind. He made atonement for mankind, not excuses. Do you all get that? Because only a couple of people say amen. Some people say amen. Mm -hmm. God sent his only begotten son to Calvary for everyone in this room and under the sun. The least you can do and I can do is get specific about what our children are doing to the God that sent his only begotten son who did not lie, who did not cheat, who did not do any of the things that our children are doing righteously on the cross. I think it will behoove us early in the morning to get down on our knees and talk to God about our problems so God can understand because we need God to understand that the little one in our house is not acting right because the little one in his house grew up and the little one in his house became a man and the little one in his house went to Calvary. For the little one in your house in my Y'all get the picture this morning? Don't let the devil take you out with your relationship with God. When you get up early in the morning, start your prayer list after the giving God credit for who he is. Get down on your knees in your prayer room where it's quiet and say, little Ellis, little Danny, little David, little Denisha. Give their names to God. And as a parent, you know, you know, if your children are wrong, you know what they're doing. <laughs> Father, help them out of adultery. Help them out of fornication. Help them out of homosexuality. Help them out of anger. Help them out of talking about people. Help them out of, about using people. Help them to be honest. Get specific with God. Because it is your duty and mine for us to let God know what Jesus died for. Right. We got plenty of time in the morning, so don't get up late tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Don't get up late tomorrow. God's with you in the morning. 
Go to the bathroom, that's a good room to play, pray in. Ain't nobody in there with you. You know what I said? In the morning, when you go to the bathroom, ain't nobody in there with you. You get up early enough, you get everybody in the house. Mm -hmm. So when you go in and you do your early morning stuff, sit on the bathtub. Don't sit on the toilet. Sit on the bathtub and cut the light off. Now you know your, don't get scared because you know your bathroom. You know where the door is, you know where the wall is. And sit down and have a two or three minute prayer with God. He gets specific. Say, Lord, I thank you. No, 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 no. Lord, I thank you for being the creator. I thank you for being everything that you are and everything, Father, that you are going to continue to be while the world exists. And I thank you for getting me up this morning. I thank you for the breath that I took. I thank you for the mind that I have. And I thank you that even though I'm swallowing a couple of pills in a few minutes, I'm still alive. I thank you for my backache. I thank you for my knee ache. I thank you for the fingers that's not working right. Just start thanking God. And after you give God the praise and you thank him for all that he has done that you don't have to do, say, Heavenly Father, I got something I need to talk to you about this morning. And his name is Eddie. What is his name? Eddie. What is his name? I don't know who you want to call. Whoever that person is, because I can't name that person for you. And then get specific. And when you get through with your prayer, don't leave you out. Amen? Amen. Father, I saved myself for last because I know I have issues too. Help me with the problems that I see in my children and in others, and help me not be the problem so the problem can get solved. And then go on with your day. Every morning do this, and you know something wrong? You gonna look around, and things are going to get better. Don't you be the enabler. And when you see your grown son and your grown daughter, say to them, when they cut it up, Erica, I pray to Say to them, Jessica, I pray to Say that to them. Kiss them and walk away. Because the last thing they need to see, just in case God calls the woman, is you always concerned about their well-being. Don't let your children know that what they're doing is right in your eyesight when they're doing wrong. So I have to say this. That's your job and that's my job. Okay. Yes. When the blessings come around. And God will tell those angels in that spiritual world, according to Daniel chapter 9, we got something else to fight for. Because the prayer just came in. So we read Daniel chapter 9. And he said, we heard you 21 days ago. Because remember, they're busy too. Fighting the devil who don't want to let us go. They're busy too. And you and I just petition to God and put on his place more who is worth fighting for. Don't tell your children you love them if you're not going to pray for them. Because it will be weak. Amen. Amen. And that's chapter 2. It made it perfectly clear. When sermons like this was preached, those 11 men got up because they did what God told them to do when it was now 12. And the church was started. It was born. In Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 22, the men of Israel hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him. In your midst, as you yourself also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and form of God, which foreknowledge of God, you 
have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. That's why the first day of the week, the Lord suffered so important. Because we have to remember the guilt that we did all week long because of the initiative guilt that was done to the righteous son. Whom God raised up, having loose the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Jesus went down and then the third day, all those three days into the grave, preached to those souls during Noah's time, took what was captive, and brought him back. And death could not hold him. Mm -hmm. God said, on the third day, you'll be raised. And on the third day, he was. First born from the dead, they got very specific. For David says concerning him, for I foresaw the Lord always before my face. But he is at the right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoices and my tongue will glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in need, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known in me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, and he is both dead and buried, and in his tomb is with us today. Therefore, being a prophet in knowledge, and, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Before seeing this, so concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh come to rest. This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses, therefore being taught in the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out things which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your spirit. Therefore let all the house of Israel know surely that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, it was cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to him, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is to you and your what? Next generation. And the next generation. And the next generation. See how the Bible flows? Because all who are far off, as me, as the Lord God will call. The garments are in the back. The pool is on the second floor. We will take you up. I'll give you the water with you. Go down with you. We'll put you fully under the water where every part of your body is immersed. Where you are sharing the death, burial, and resurrection with Jesus Christ. So when you come up, you come up brand spanking new. Ready for a new relationship with God. Ready for a new life with God. And leave all that past sin behind. Isn't that a good deal? That's a good deal. You're not going to find a better deal in the world than that. That everything that you did and everything that I did is left in the world of the baptism. Where God is going to look at you, brand spanking you, just like you did with that baby's in your mouth. And you looked at that child innocent, that bundle of joy. The only thing you wanted to do was keep hugging and kissing the baby all the time. Because you know it's innocent. You know there's nothing wrong with it. You know that it's blemished. You know that everything about it is great. Amen? Second phase of this is for Christians who have strayed off since the last time we met. Father said to yourself, I cannot do this. Yes, you can. The prayer of the faith will help you get through another day. But you may have sinned to the point where you just can't talk to God and your prayers are not getting approved. There are two categories on Sunday morning at the end of the sermon. You either fit in the unsafe category or the category of sin. Now that doesn't mean that everybody that's sitting here is all right. That means that we have managed our lives week by week. Now I did that. I did that. Because I realized that I was a sinner. And I said to myself, I got to fix my relationship with God. That's right. And I went down to the morning and I got clean. The song has been selected. The invitation has been given. And our song is 985. When morning comes, you can 
you come down this aisle, you let us know. You can put out that prayer request card. You let us know. You can come down and we get the garments. Don't worry about the clothes that you wear on you. Put out those plastic suits where nothing is revealed. And we take you down in the water and baptize you. Put a towel around your shoulder and you can dry yourself off and be brand new. Or you can come forward now as we stand and sing.